were no subsea cables on the East Coast and into Southern Africa. Uh, back, this was back in 2006, 2007. And SECOM was actually created and the investment gathered from mostly African private equity investors to build the cable in 2007. So as early as 2007, this is when the Apple iPhone came out, you may recall, um, I think there was a, a, a view that Africa and certainly the east coast of Africa needed subsea connectivity because obviously the cost and the latency, the, the time it takes for signals to go to satellites was just not uh, feasible or affordable uh, for users in eastern Africa. So you know, the group of investors got together and they, it took two years to build the cable. Uh, put in almost half a billion US dollars to build it with this vision that if you build it you can actually improve the economies and the business environments in eastern and southern Africa. Uh, so really we went live July 23rd uh, 2009 and I think at that point in time a lot of things changed pretty dramatically in the world of the internet in Africa uh, and I think a lot of that was the result of SECOM going live at that time. We had a group of investors, okay. private equity investors, and we built a private cable. So it's very true that, yeah, prior to that, and there are other cables in Africa that are yeah. consortiums. Usually that means that the incumbent uh, telecom operator, usually government owned, yeah. invests and then controls access to the cable. So we are kind of a revolution, uh, even globally. There are not that many private cable systems globally. And certainly we were the first in Africa. Uh, so our private investors were mostly in the infrastructure area and they saw the need, you know, whether it's electricity, whether it's road, whether it's power generation, or it's building fiber optic infrastructure, that was important for Africa's growth. And there would be huge demand for this. Um, so it just happened to be that in July 2009, SECOM was the first cable to go live uh, and to offer connectivity uh, into markets in the eastern. Uh, it's a very large project, as I said, so I think the, the key thing there is it takes two years at least to build. It mm -hmm. depends on the complexity, can even take three years, depending on how many landings you have and how many uh, seas you must cross. But generally speaking, a subsea cable project is a huge amount of money. It's highly capital intensive, mm -hmm. and you don't see any revenues while you're building. So you're building a cable for two years, maybe even mm -hmm. more than two years. And so SECOM took that time from 2007 to 2009 to build the cable. You've got to construct landing stations, you have to get regulatory approvals in all the mm -hmm. landing countries, you have to get the cable stations built, the electronics in, the cable laid, you have to make sure you have all the regulatory environmental approvals, fishing union approvals, if the cable is going to cross gas pipelines, other yeah. cables, all those approvals have to be gathered together and make sure you have everything and you have a massive project plan. So it's uh, it was a challenge uh, to get it built. We had a lot of difficulties, uh, but we managed to, to make it through and, and, and construct the cable largely on time. The countries that helped enable uh, yeah. the Seacom cable uh, mm -hmm. and have it land into their markets have seen radical changes and growth in the kind of, you know, internet-based economy, if we put it that way. Um, certainly, you know, there's still a lot of markets in South Africa that are closed to this kind of private initiative. Yeah. And I think, generally speaking, you would see that they aren't developing their economies as quickly as a result. Um, so I think it is, you know, I think roads, ports, airports, electricity, and internet connectivity are yeah. kind of almost the basic foundations uh, for development in today's world. And I think that internet <coughs> part uh, actually plays more and more of an important role. And I think what we've seen in Kenya, as you mentioned, the business process outsourcing capabilities, yeah. the effect on efficiency in business, mm -hmm. migration to the cloud, and things so that companies can actually you know, focus on their business using the internet to enable that and to drive efficiency. Yeah. But also tech hubs, or even some of the things we see activity with companies in uh, you know, the Silicon Savannah who are developing capabilities to serve companies in Europe or in the United States. Yeah. So I think that all comes together, uh, but I think that internet connectivity is almost one of those basic fundamental building blocks.
when CECOM was constructed, yeah, we did have outages. And when actually CECOM had issues, and all cable systems have issues, whether it's an anchor dragging it up or it's an earthquake or, or any electronics failures, these things can happen. But I think what happened when CECOM went live is that everyone was overly reliant on that one cable system because it was the first and only one. Now what's happened is there's more other infrastructure in yeah. place and yeah. we build a more of a mesh network mm -hmm. that provides services to our customers. Okay. So we brought affordability, but we also brought the reliability. And that took some time. We yeah. had to actually get the West Coast system up, yeah. which was called WAX, the yeah. West African Coast uh, mm -hmm. Cable System. And that really helped as well to yeah. build redundancy in the network. At, when CECOM went live, there were some other cables that were constructed also on the East Coast of Africa. Uh, but, you know, just it's a, it's a the fact of geography that those cables going up the east coast of Africa, going through the Red Sea, going across Egypt and into Europe, yeah. which is where most of the content and compute power was at that time, yeah. um, you all had to go along that path. So sometimes we would get outages and it would take down all of those cables at the same time. As a matter of fact, we had that happen just off the coast of Egypt. So crossing the Mediterranean, you have kind of what we would call single points of failure in the network. So routing traffic from Kenya, for example, south and around Africa or through South Africa and up the west coast of Afri Africa gives you resiliency. So the idea was that ring around Africa so that if you ever had failures, not just on the SECOM system, but on those other cable systems, we could provide the service going around Africa the other way. Now, of course, that's a longer distance, therefore there's some latency <coughs> issues, but it's better than no connectivity. Um, so really, I think when we talk about building networks that are either ring protected or meshed, which means you have multiple paths. You know, that is inherent in how we build a reliable uh, a network. So that the, the, the kind of expectation now is that a customer's service is always on and the outages do not occur when you're cut off, right? They may occur that you see some latency changes or something like that as traffic is rerouted, but those are largely service unaffected. In the industry globally, you have this idea that there's a huge capital outlay, build a cable system, and then that cable system takes on all the capacity and can go through upgrades, and it reaches a point where you need to build another one. It's kind of like building a, a large apartment building. All the people move in, the building slowly fills up. Once it fills up, you build another building. You don't build 10 buildings at yeah, the yeah. same time and have 10% occupancy in each of them. So I think that's a natural occurrence that there's a lag between, because it's such a large capital outlay, and because it takes so much time and is so complicated. So uh, I think today what you're seeing is the, the Seacom cable system, the Easy cable system, the Teams cable system all launched roughly around the same time. Easy was about a year later than us. Yeah. Um, and WAX came along in 2012, but the capacity in those systems only can be upgraded to a certain limit and they're getting older. So they're now 10 years old, maybe they have another 15 years of life left in them. Generally speaking, a subsea cable will last about 25 years. But, so I think, you know, when you look at it from that perspective, any of the new cables being announced today, will it take at least two years to be completed? So by that time, you can see the, the ramp up of capacity on the existing system, they will become saturated so that new cables are needed just from a capacity perspective. In addition to that, new cables offer resiliency. So when they're built, the new cables will be built will be at different landing points. They will be routed in different places under the oceans, uh, and they will land and connect into different places. So yeah. I think what you're seeing is more resiliency in the network, more reliability in the network. And of course, there's the affordability aspect. The new cables, new technology can ramp up capacity uh, beyond what we can do with the technology we used uh, back in 2007, 2008 to build the system. So I think there's that affordability uh, when you talk about big volume. And when you get to the, the players who've announced the cables uh, yeah. that are being talked about, namely that's Google and Facebook, um, they've made public announcement. Uh, you know, these are guys who, they need that capacity. So their business is very much connecting data centers to data centers so that they can move their content, their applications, mm -hmm. and their traffic between those data centers. Uh, and so of course you'd expect that these kind of companies would be interested in building the infrastructure that they need. Seacom's always been open access. Built it at private, we've always been open access. Um, the cables that are being talked about will also be open access. Um, I think, you know, otherwise they wouldn't get built. So I, I don't, I mean, certainly I think for a consumer and for a business, it's going to be great. 
No question about yeah. it. It means more capacity on more routes that's more affordable, better quality, and, and no one's going to complain about data prices going down and higher speed internet, whether you're a consumer or whether you're a business customer. The focus uh, over the last years after CECOM was completed was to how do we feed the data requirements uh, and traffic flows into the marketplace. Okay. You know? And I think you know, building it to a cable station in Mombasa in Kenya, as an mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. only got us so far. We had to get that connectivity into Nairobi and then into Kampala, as an example. Uh, and that was where the key metropolitan hubs where people really needed that connectivity were. Um, so yeah, we have been investing uh, in local infrastructure and also in companies that have good customer base, have connectivity into buildings, uh, mostly in the business side of things. So yeah. we kind of focus on providing services to service providers, but also into corporates. So that's quite key for us where we deploy our network. And so we look at the map of Africa, we look at kind of key metropolitan areas where businesses need connectivity. And that's our, that's our focus. The, the connectivity across South Africa is also very important for East Africa. You may not think about it, but uh, when you want to provide that resiliency and protection on the East Coast, as I said, you sometimes have to route traffic along the West Coast of Africa. How do you get it there? So we land our Seacom cable near Durban. We actually have to carry huge amounts of traffic across South Africa to connect onto the Western cable system. Some that are there today, some that are coming in the future. Um, so that Fiberco acquisition allows us to do that. In other words, create that ring and make that ring scalable. Because now we own fibers connecting East Coast and West mm -hmm. Coast. But it also allows us to deploy into more towns and cities in yeah. South Africa, which is also mm -hmm. important. Yeah. But it's really about how do we provide better and better connectivity to mm -hmm. where our customers need that connectivity. We started off Seacom in 2009 only providing connectivity to service providers. So okay. companies, mobile network operators or other ISPs that then offered that into the marketplace. Uh, but I think for Seacom's own growth and actually to provide what the market required, we decided uh, about four years ago in South Africa and about three years ago in Kenya to drive into the business marketplace directly yeah. ourselves. So we don't do consumer, um, but we empower consumers through our connectivity that we provide to mobile network operators, yeah. as an example. Uh, but we thought there is a need about businesses, big corporations, particularly ones who need international data connectivity to power their business, as you say. And I think you know, that became a very, that's a much larger marketplace, but it does present challenges in that you need to get the network to where those customers are. And, and that's why you've seen that investment in terrestrial fibers yes. and in metro fibers to get to office parks and yeah. get to large corporate uh, headquarters, et cetera, so that we can provide a service directly to those customers. In Kenya, we're very focused. Um, so we focus on the large corporations that need that international data connectivity. Um, so we're kind of a little more focused with uh, who we want as a customer in Kenya. Um, and we've been very successful. Uh, yeah. I think that, you know, of most of the largest corporations in Kenya, uh, we can check those boxes and say we provide service to them. Now, it's not always that we provide all their services because yeah. many have branch offices and we don't have that capability. But certainly at their headquarters and certainly for their data connectivity, we're one of the key providers now. To deliver those connectivity solutions to customers in Kenya, as an example, mostly yeah. in Mombasa, Nairobi today, uh, but we are expanding our footprint in Kenya. Um, we work with partners to deliver what we would call that last mile solution. Yes. So we would deliver to our key metro pops, expand those metro pops throughout Nairobi, and then we spur off connections, uh, usually in a, a ring structure, into those uh, corporate offices. It just tends to be that if you look at the connectivity requirements, and even when people talk about cloud and migration to the cloud and data consumption, you would have financial institutions as the number one consumer, yes. yeah. manufacturing would probably be at the bottom end because in a manufacturing site, you don't yeah. live and breathe that connectivity. And so I think, you know, we kind of focus on this end, where are the industries, whether it's business process outsourcing or tech hubs or media or financial institutions, that's where for us, the key demand is for the kind of services we provide. We actually have officially launched in Uganda ah, yeah, that's good. a few months back. Um, we've always been in Uganda at a service provider level. So yeah, we have a yeah, backbone yeah. that goes into Kampala, uh, meshed routes that go to connect into Uganda. Uh, and this is really just the next step, which is we will serve corporates directly in Kampala. The challenge is the SME market is very large in terms of volume. 
right? But the, the affordability points are quite okay. low uh, and they're quite spread out. So obviously, just like consumer, that presents a challenge in how do you reach those customers. And Seacom uh, is very much a believer in fiber optic solutions, so we try to build everything on a fiber basis so that okay. it's scalable, affordable, and future-proof. Uh, so we can change electronics and upgrade those connections uh, without huge investment in more infrastructure. Uh, and we realize that some SMEs will, are okay to be served by wireless solutions, and I think that will continue for some time. So I think we tend to focus on where is the demand for high-speed connectivity, reliable connectivity, uh, amongst the, the, the players who are really, it is a core aspect of their business. There's a lot of times financial institutions mm -hmm. or media companies, things like that. Companies like that that really live and breathe on the internet. It's actually a requirement. You can't really have the growth of the internet and this data connectivity without places where equipment that su supplies that infrastructure can reside. And I think carrier neutral data centers are very important. And I think you're already seeing more and more investment in carrier neutral data centers around Africa. And certainly, when we see them come up, we will immediately make sure our network is available, our service is available out of those data centers. The price from our perspective, where we serve our service provider customers or we serve a corporate customer, the price of internet has come down dramatically. It's already as low, almost as low as it is in Europe or the United States. Mm -hmm. But I believe when, when people talk about that, what they're really talking about is on their handsets. Uh, exactly. And I think, that's, as you say, it's a consumer challenge. And I think, you know, people have talked a lot about different technologies, whether it's 3G, LTE, 4G, 5G now. Mm -hmm. um, it still requires a lot of investment uh, in equipment and in infrastructure underlying those networks. Yeah. So the dilemma that's faced by the, the market, I would say, is consumers want their prices to fall, but mobile network operators are forced to invest more and more to provide the service. So somehow there needs to be that balance. Uh, and it's a challenge when you have new technologies coming out every few years. So even the coverage in, in Kenya, for example, I think 4G, if it's covering a third of the country, I'd be surprised. And now people are talking about 5G. Yeah. So, you know, from a mobile network operator's perspective, I've got to invest more, <laughs> yeah. you know, in more places to yeah. provide this. And consumers will not pay more. They want to pay less. So how do I give you a better service over more infrastructure that costs me capital, also in U.S. dollars? Most of the equipment that would come in would be purchased in foreign currency. So that's a challenge too in local marketplaces. So I think it, it's a challenge. I don't know, it, I think it can be solved in lots of ways. Mm -hmm. I think certainly having the underlying fiber infrastructure helps because when you have a super highway that goes further and further into the market, yeah. that means it's more affordable to get it from key metropolitan towns and cities to the internet. And then I think then you have the radio <coughs> access that gets out to the customers. So I think, you know, it's kind of a process as we drive deeper into the market, get closer to the customer. Yeah. And I think what Seacom's doing will also benefit consumers yeah. longer term. It just takes time and investment. The demand, there's no question about it. I think everyone would, would love to have, you know, 10 gigs per second to their phone. And once yeah. they get that, they'd want 100 gig. Um, you know, so I think there's no, no question about the demand. The question really is, is it a good business proposition? Can the ecosystem support those requirements uh, based on the revenue generated. And I think that's the challenge. And that's why you think you see mobile network companies going into FinTech or you know, M-Pesa in, yeah. in, uh, in Kenya, things like that, because you know, it's difficult uh, to grow your revenue and to grow your profit margin, or even to have a profit margin, if you're continually having to invest in the network, but your customer's not willing to pay anymore. Um, certainly it impacts uh, at CECOM, I think, We've always built our network to be as affordable as possible, so we build for scale. So everything we do is built over fiber with DWDM equipment that allows us to upgrade very, at very low costs and always be on the front edge of not only service quality and delivery, but on cost. In 10 years, we've seen some radical changes uh, in the markets that we serve in terms of just data connectivity, and now people more talking about uh, price per meg and you know caps and all these things that were unheard of before. I mean, no one had data connectivity before. Yeah. So I think the market has matured in that sense. But you can see that consumers, businesses, uh, everyone's expectations continue always to grow. Is it fast enough? Is it always on? Is it always reliable? So I think Seacom will continue to provide the backbone uh, for the industry. Uh, we'll be involved in new projects as they come up to make sure that our customers get reliability quality of service and affordability. 
with what we offer. And that means more investments uh, into the markets we choose to, to serve. So I think we'll see more terrestrial investments uh, as well as acquisitions uh, to get more network and to get more scale uh, that we can feed over our backbone. The industry has some challenges. I mean, it's getting more and more competitive. Uh, and you know the business cases for investment have to be scrutinized, so people have to be very careful. And in Africa, of course, you have issues like political risk or currency risk. Uh, and of course, as Africa is developing, I think even the fundamental construction of projects that I described are more challenging. Uh, and mainly, this, if you don't have uh, you know, highways with guardrails, it's actually quite difficult to build terrestrial fiber. Um, so obviously, they kind of go together. So I think there's a long way to go in terms of just fundamental infrastructure that needs to be improved that will then drive even greater penetration of fiber uh, and better service out to regional areas uh, around Africa, for example. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, as I mentioned, I, it's critical to be scalable because I think one thing we have learned is that the demand for capacity, the demand for internet connectivity just keeps growing. Yeah. And in Africa, you have a very long pop young population uh, and I think the hunger for that connectivity will continue to grow. So you need to be scalable and ready for that to happen. And you need to make sure that it's affordable so that it can be suitable for the marketplace you're in. Yeah.